So if anyone doesn't know me, my name is Lauren and I'm in year two of my PhD at the University of Nottingham. And I am going to tell you a little bit around the background, around my topic. And, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm doing to research it. So my title is, is Elder Speak Always Inappropriate? An Empirical Investigation of the Use of Elder Speak in Dementia Care. So I'm not going to go into loads of detail around um, kind of dementia and the symptoms because I think Professor Denon has kind of recovered that really well already today. Um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, mention that obviously we know it's a very complex condition and has lots of different uh, kind of needs and symptoms. Um, but communication is a kind of key um, thing that can be difficult, which is my interest. So um, we know kind of care has moved on a lot over the last, uh, even maybe 50 years. Um, it used to be very uh, institutionalized and was often kind of just about containing people. And then it's kind of become, in the most part at least, um, a little bit more person-centered and is more kind of um, about kind of individual identity and personhood. Um, so if I go to the next slide. Um, so if Tom Kitwood was a key figure in kind of uh, coming up with person-centered care. Um, so um, as kind of we already mentioned, it's more rather than seeing it as like a, a biological condition with inevitable decline, dementia is kind of viewed more now as um, kind of like a disability where we can make accommodations. Um, so I wanted to just kind of highlight this here because obviously our theme for the day is unmet needs and um, person-centered care is kind of more about kind of company, individual needs. But, um, there is some research such as that done by Featherstone and Northcott which suggests that uh, things are still kind of quite far from ideal. Um, there could be kind of improvements in some areas, such as in uh, hospital wards. Um, so the acute hospital environment is my area of interest. And um, this is a place that could potentially be very confusing or stressful for someone who is living with dementia. Um, it's estimated that around a quarter of hospital beds in the UK are occupied by someone living with dementia. Um, <clears throat> Some estimate even higher than this, but it's really difficult to know for sure. Um, often these people are kind of undiagnosed and um, like, uh, yeah, we don't know for sure how many people, but it's uh, quite a lot. Um, but, um, but this is a kind of a key area where people living with dementia might have unmet needs. Um, some have estimated that people living with dementia admitted to hospital are actually up to twice as likely to die compared to someone without dementia admitted with the same conditions. So uh, you can see how communication might be really important here. Um, and professionals often have difficulty with this. Communication has been reported as challenging uh, in circumstances involving people living with dementia. Um, but how we talk to people is really important. So um, it can affect lots of things like how people uh, see themselves. Sorry, I just a uh, drink. <laughs> so that's better. I'm usually quite quiet and talking loud is hard. <laughs> um, so uh, elder speak is my key area of interest. Um, it's a type of communication which is often used by younger people towards older adults. It involves features such as shortened sentences, speaking slower, um, using a higher pitch or tone of voice, uh, excessive praise and potentially inappropriate terms of endearment for the situation. So this is just a quick example of how it might look in practice. Um, as you can see here, kind of, um, it, it could be very easy to use this kind of talk. Um, the daughter is probably generally trying to help, 
um, but the mother can maybe feel like uncomfortable or feel this is unnecessary. So I'll just give you a second to read that. Um, so often people say this kind of communication is similar to the way you might speak to a young, a young child. Uh, obviously this comes with certain connotations. Uh, it could result in things maybe like lower self-esteem, withdrawal, depression, resistance to care. Um, and this takes us to the key focus of my project, which is, is elder speak always an appropriate? Is it always a bad thing? This is where the area gets a lot more unclear. Um, research just show that elder speak is often used with good intentions. Um, care staff are obviously trying to help and they often believe this kind of talk is useful. Some think maybe it helps like with task completion or is maybe reassuring. Um, and also research groups out to speak as a whole phenomenon uh, when people might react to the different features differently and not everyone uses it as a whole. So um, an example of this I just wanted to cover briefly is uh, known as comfort talk. So this shares a lot of uh, features with elder speak um, and is used uh, in hospital trauma centers uh, by nurses towards patients in quite considerable distress. Um, so it's similar to elder speak because they use something like praise, uh, loud simplified language. Uh, I'm not saying that all elder speak could be considered comforting, definitely not. Uh, but I am saying that maybe in some quite specific circumstances, it could potentially be comforting. But um, we do obviously need to be very careful as uh, the negative consequences of well elder speak could be um, very bad. It could be, you know, threatening to individual identity, personhood, um, self-esteem, etc. Uh, if used in the wrong way and then lead to more needs and not being there. Um, but at the moment, research-wise at least, um, with elder speak, we really don't know kind of what could be considered appropriate or inappropriate by those of them with dementia, which is really what I'm trying to unravel. Um, so this brings us to my research questions. Uh, firstly, uh, where is elder speak being used and who is using it? And secondly, how is elder speak, um, how do people living with dementia actually receive and respond to elder speak? in real interactions. And then finally, what is the impact of context? Because you could uh, argue, for instance, that like taking someone's med medical history is a very different situation to like, if you're assisting them with eating. So people might react differently. So uh, very briefly, so far, um, I'm in year two. So um, I've done some training and a literature review and at the moment, um, I'm in the middle of analyzing some pre-existing data. Um, this was collected from a previous project that my supervisors were involved in. Um, it involves video interactions of uh, people living with dementia and uh, staff on hospital ward. And then hopefully soon, uh, I'll be collecting some additional data to add to this. Um, just briefly, I want to mention that I'm using conversation analysis. I'm definitely not going to uh, go into too much detail here because I know like we have experts and they know a lot more than me. Um, but I just wanted to kind of highlight that it's really useful for this kind of research um, because you can kind of show a lot more detail than you would kind of in other methods when looking at interactions. So like um, right here, uh, HP is the healthcare professional and PT is the patient. And um, like we might have a little bit of elder speak going on kind of towards the end, I don't know what screen to point out, but um, they've got some kind of increases in pitch and pauses, um, some minimizing some drawn out words. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. But uh, I think I'm probably running out of time, I don't know. So um, <laughs> I'll just uh, kind of finish up. So to say, hopefully uh, this research will be able to make a useful contribution to the literature on elder speak and then also on hospital communication and dementia care more widely. Um, it's a really skilled area. So obviously we need research to find out what works and doesn't work in actual practice kind of on the ward. So then hopefully we can use that to improve the experience of uh, hospital for people with dementia in the future. And 
that's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, we do have five minutes. You, you, you <laughs> Am I over that? More skipped? time <laughs> by any means. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, yeah, yes. So thank you, Lauren. It's really <laughs> interesting to hear about your project. You alluded to collecting some new data to complement the second data set from the voice project. Can you give, give us um, a hint at you know the setting, the context, and, yeah. and what you're doing vis a vis new data? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how much uh, <laughs> um, people know about the voice project initially, but um, I'm going to be involved with voice two, which is uh, occurring now. So uh, it's going to be kind of on a similar setting uh, on a healthcare of the old people's ward on the um, UK hospitals. Um, and then it's going to be um, kind of hopefully sort of continuing on from voice one. Um, but their focus for their wide project is to stress behavior. Um, I'm kind of um, helping out with the data collection and then uh, um, it's a very exciting at the moment where I've just got like, the approvals and stuff, so it's good to go. But um, I don't know, <laughs> did I answer any of that? So, so it's a generic <laughs> older people's yeah. hospital ward yes. in the same kind of geographical environment as before, so in, in, in sort of the Nottingham area? Or? Um, yes, there is two sites for data collection, mm -hmm. Nottingham and also Leeds. So um, I'll be focusing on that for my small area, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We have a question from Ethna online. Let me just get you set up. Ethna, one second. Oh, I'm to like look at both. It's very weird. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. Um, thanks so much for your talk. I found it very interesting. Um, my research is about hearing loss and dementia. Obviously, you, you mentioned that a bit in your talk in the example you gave of the, I think it was a woman and her daughter. Um, I was wondering if that's something you'll be kind of considering that comorbidity in your research. I know that just as you were describing elder talk there, I was thinking it kind of goes against some of the recommended communication strategies for hearing loss about things like speaking clearly rather than loudly or not distorting your speech pattern, keeping your speech pattern normal so that people can lip read you more easily and things like that. And also we know there's problems in hospital environments with hearing aids getting lost or, you know, people not knowing how to help people put in or change the batteries on the hearing aids. So is that Will you look at that or just, you know, that might not be a priority for you? Um, yeah, thank you for the, your question. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently um, because it's, it's very difficult to kind of argue um, if someone's kind of talking to a patient like loudly and clearly what their underlying motivation is. So are they, are they doing it in a way to kind of you know, have they perceived them as vulnerable in some way and they're kind of elder speak talking at them? Or are they doing it because they're trying to adapt to like a hearing loss or some other kind of difficulty with communication? And it is very difficult to unravel. Um, I don't have a definitive answer. It's just kind of, it's something that I'm kind of struggling with at the moment. Um, but I definitely have thought about it and hopefully We'll have a better answer in the future. <laughs> That's great. And um, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, any more questions? In that case, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you.